Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. I'm Elaine Cha. The key word that you said was unanticipated. Each time a student is moving, they're losing some of it. They don't get agency in those decisions most of the time. Maybe it's not as beneficial as it looks. Um, I think a lot of times we're like, hey, well, we, we allocated this amount of money here, but how is it being spent? Mobility by itself suggests capacity, the potential to move up, ahead, around. Student mobility, however, refers to a phenomenon that's cause for concern. It's a term that describes students transferring between schools midway through a school year and the disruptions it can cause. And it's a real-life reality linked to learning and social challenges that impact pupils and their teachers, too. The St. Louis Research Practice Collaborative has issued a report that examines student mobility in St. Louis. While the rate of St. Louis student mobility has declined in recent years, it remains higher than those of other cities and counties in Missouri. Here to discuss the report, we have Jason Jabari, assistant professor in the Brown School at Washington University. Jason leads the education research portfolio at WashU Social Policy Institute and was one of the researchers for the new report. Jason, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Now, as noted in our intro, mobility is typically considered a good thing, right? There's social mobility. Um, some degree of mobility for students could theoretically be good for building adaptability and resiliency. How is the student mobility you're looking at different, Jason? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think one of the main differences is that the student mobility we're looking at um, are you know, unanticipated moves. So these are often cases where students uh, are moving uh, kind of unexpectedly to a new school, a new district, uh, sometimes a new county. Uh, And these can have really serious consequences for student learning as well as school culture and and classroom practices. Can you give maybe one or two specific examples of those challenges that you've just mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we think about the research that's been done on student mobility, we've seen, uh, you know, associations with decreased test scores, uh, sometimes increased behavioral problems, uh, low attendance rates uh, as well. And all of those, I think, really add up to create uh, some challenges for for classrooms and schools uh, that serve students that are highly mobile, as well as can, you know, offer some challenges for students in these learning contexts. So Mm -hmm. for students that are highly mobile, uh, really having a hard time, I think, integrating in schools and classrooms, feeling welcome. Uh, and also, you know, following the curriculum and, and being able to progress uh, and achieve things in their in their education. Mm-hmm. And you were looking at students K through t- twelve in this study. Yes, in the first report, yes, it, it looked at students uh, across all grade spans. Mm-hmm. Now, the St. Louis Research Practice Collaborative it involves several partners that include public and charter schools. Now, typically. And people think of public and charter as competitors or at least not uh, friendly fellows. For this study, though, they worked together. Why is that important, if not necessary? Yeah, I think, you know, it's really important for mobility to be seen as, as a regional problem uh, and a regional challenge. And so I think if we want to silo this into traditional public or charter schools, uh, we really won't have a full understanding of the problem. And we may not be able to come up with solutions that really work for families. Because even if students are leaving a traditional public school, uh, sometimes they're coming into a charter school and vice versa. And so when we think about mobility, it's, it's not just a, a single school or a single district uh, problem. It's really a region-wide problem that I think will c- require a lot of collective efforts to, to help solve. Mm-hmm. And you had mentioned that it's unanticipated moves that you're looking at, and that is how you are understanding mobility. Why are kids moving? What is what is it causing the, the picking up and, and moving, um, especially during the school year? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And so, you know, we are currently in the process of in kind of our next stage of this research is to really pinpoint some of these uh, predictive factors for mobility. But by looking at the past research and, and, you know, thinking about the stories that have been told anecdotally, you know, sometimes for students that are living in high poverty areas, things like eviction, um, you know, things like job loss uh, that really, you know, can, can impact students at a family level. And so I think when we look at the research that's been done, it's some of these things that happen, you know, in neighborhoods and in families that then spill over into students' education. And so we're, we're really excited about the next phase of this research, and we recognize that there are going to be a lot of things that I think uh, related to families and households um, that, that are related to mobility. Mm-hmm. Now, this first part of the study does examine the 2018-2019 school year, and it found on average that more than one-third of school children in St. Louis transfer in and out of schools during the school year. Is that as high as it sounds, especially considering rates in past years? Yes. I mean, this is a really high number. When we think about, uh, you know, and, and I think it was 38%, you know, across the board. And so that's a really large number of students who are, are coming in and coming out of classrooms that, you know, again, I think are going to have serious consequences for the students who are highly mobile, but also for the classroom uh, teachers and, and school leaders who are working in these contexts to be able to really serve students in this way. Mm-hmm. One of the things we did see that in the 2010-2011 school year, That was some time ago, but the mobility rate at that time was 51%. So, I mean, 38 obviously is not good, but compared to 51, I mean, what accounts for that decrease? Do you have information about that? No, we're, we're, we're excited to really explore that in our, in our next phase to kind of think about what did lead to the decrease. Um, I think, you know, when we think about that time of, of right around uh, 2010, 2011, 2012, uh, we know that there is a significant housing crisis. And so um, kind of across the board, uh, it, it appears that there were much higher rates of mobility, you know, really kind of around that time. Um, and so I think we're, we're excited to be able to dive into that in our next phase, but also just kind of recognizing that that was a unique time in, in, uh, in American context. Mm-hmm. So we are talking right now about a study, and it has to do with numbers, but children are not numbers, right? So we also have joining us here today, Andrew Eason, who's a fifth grade math, science, and social studies teacher, a utility player at Ashland Elementary in St. Louis, and that is in the Penrose neighborhood. And Andrew, you've seen uh, student mobility play out in the classroom level. We're, We're glad that you're here with us today. Thank you for having me. Now, Jason just said that student mobility percentages, part of the reason there was that difference between 2011, uh, I'm sorry, 2010, 2011, and 2018, 2019, had to do with housing crisis, right? Um, Your teaching during that school year that's covered by the study, 2018, 2019, and we've been through a pandemic since then. What effect did the pandemic have on student mobility from your vantage point? I think from my vantage point, um, as far as the pandemic is concerned, I mean, we see that, you know, we were people were staying home a lot. Um, You know, there, of course, school districts were trying to figure out how do we how do we move past this problem? How do we fix it? Um, and it was a lot of virtual learning, things of that sort, you know. And so as far as students moving around, I think. I think it was a little bit more stable to me during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I think now that we have kind of transitioned out of those periods, I think we're seeing a higher rate now where people are, students are starting to move around a little bit more. Um, And I think that, you know, of course that causes a big issue within the classroom. Mm -hmm. Could you tell um, to some degree with the students you are working with, whether they were They were mobile during the virtual period, meaning like they would be with you for class for some period of time during the week at one place and then perhaps somewhere else on other days? Yes, um, that was actually a consistent problem um, because when you're moving to different environments, those there's there are different learning environments as well. You know, so where Wi-Fi might work at one area, maybe it doesn't work at the other area or maybe I'm having uh, trouble completing my assignments because in one area it's a quiet, you know, environment and in another area it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of noise, a lot of distractions. Maybe I have sisters and brothers who need my attention as well. Mm-hmm. So the dynamic gets a little 
you know, uneven there. Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of jokes people were making about, um, you know, like furry co-workers, uh, like a, a cat or a, or a dog coming in. But if you're a student and you're a child, that is a, a different sort of um, environment to be to be dealing with. It is. It is. I mean, as a teacher that also kind of, you know, in, in your you know, from your perspective, you're trying to, dy- you know, you're trying to maneuver this this new dynamic as well. Um, and so many of our teachers, you know, whether you're young or an older teacher, you know, you had an experience with technology that you maybe had never had to have. Mm-hmm. Um, figuring out different ways to present information and then kids having to adjust to that type of situation as well. Yeah. And so if I'm constantly moving environments, that is going to cause difficulty in my learning Mm -hmm. and continuation of learning. Yeah. So as far as mobility in general goes, in your classrooms, can you provide an example or two of how you've seen um, students affected by a high degree of mobility? Yeah. um, The key word that you said was unanticipated. And... When you get unanticipation, you you get unreadiness. You're not ready for it. Um, An adult handles that differently than a child would. Um, What I've typically seen is that, for example, if I am starting the year at one place, and we're talking current now, if I'm starting a year at one place and then I end up moving, as you say, to maybe a charter school and then I end up moving back, you know, to a public school, there are different dynamics, different teaching, um, different ways of instructing. And so now I have to adjust. Not only do I have to adjust academically, but I also have to adjust as a student socially. You know, how do I make friends? Mm -hmm. Am I comfortable enough to make those friends? You know, these are problems that I don't think we take into account. And Mm -hmm. I think that's why we are here having a, a very, very much needed conversation about student mobility, because it's something that affects our students and as you said, 38% is not as high as 51, but it's high enough. Um, yes. Now, I think on some level, you know, many people think of the classroom as the teacher's domain, right? It's like a place where an educator with great ideas and passion can turn things around for students. I mean, I think popular media has something to do with that, maybe some of the, the belief or the myth of individualism. But what is it that you can actually change or control uh, Andrew, when you have a student who's transferring in and out of your classroom, making that easier somehow? I think what we can do is, for one, provide a student voice to it. Um, I think a lot of traditional school has been the teacher feeling as if they are filling a cup and not realizing that a student's cup already has some in it. Um, Our job is to fill their cup, you know, it's to help them get there to that point. Um, And when I am constantly moving around, it's like different things keep getting getting taken out of my cup, you know, and and it's like, you know, one teacher pours something in and then another teacher has to pour some more in because they've lost some more, you know, and, and each time a student is moving, they're losing some of it, Mm -hmm. you know? And so we, I think what we, what I've tried to do is to provide some type of safe space and allow my students to have a voice to talk about those concerns and not only have a voice, but seek to fix the problems. Mm -hmm. Um, I think when I think of student mobility, I think of, you know, lack of resources. We talked about, you know, eviction. We talked about, you know, maybe a, a, a parent losing their job. And so if I'm living with someone and I lose my job, I need to go find another job. That job is maybe not available in, you know, in those neighborhoods that, you know, deal with poverty a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I have to go outside of that neighborhood. And then what happens when I'm having to take the bus two and three, you know, two and three buses to get to where I'm trying to go. It's easier if my child just switches schools, Mm -hmm. even though. You know, it's easier for the adult, but it's not as not easy for, for that child. child. Certainly. So. And kids don't, they don't get agency in, in those decisions most of the time. Mm-mm. Jason, what are some of the solutions or what has worked elsewhere, sort of given what you've heard um, Andrew talking about? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, you know, we look at some of the different programs around the country. You know, there's been things, that, you know, so in Atlanta, they actually work to help uh, provide parents resources to kind of avoid eviction and things like that. And so uh, we know that other cities have tried, you know, additional transportation methods. You know, I think, uh, as Andrew alluded to, transportation can be a, a huge issue for folks. And so I think there is these, you know, which is uh, part of the excitement that I have is like there are definitely these like core things that can happen in classrooms and schools to, you know, reduce the rates of mobility and, and, and make it so that the students feel connected and, and can learn and grow. But there's also some, I think, wider things that affect St. Louis that we can do kind of beyond the school walls. And so thinking about things like housing and transportation uh, and health care are, are things that I think, we, you know, schools and, and, and researchers can, can really have a broad look at. And I think we can uh, attack this problem in a couple different ways and, mm-hmm. and think of some innovative solutions. And I think it gets to this point that students are not just students in school. They're students in the world. Um, one of the things that did come up, uh, Andrew, when you were speaking with our producer, so at St. Louis voters last fall, they approved Proposition S. Um, that's a $160 million bond measure for repairs and renovations across 60 buildings in St. Louis public schools. So we're, we're talking about that particular space. Do you think that that will address some of the issues at the heart of this report and what you had said about creating a space that feels safe and and stable for students? I think that that is a step in the right direction. Um, But I think that if we throw money at a problem and we put it in the wrong areas or we don't put it in areas that are going to benefit, um, maybe it's not as beneficial as it looks. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of times we're like, hey, well, we, we allocated this amount of money here, but how is it being spent? And I think that really has to be the conversation. I think that uh, when we talked about the difference, you know, differences between public school as well as charter school, um, I think one thing that needs to be mentioned is that it is a citywide problem. It's not just you know, if we're playing this battle between charter and public school, then we're playing the wrong battle because ultimately the, you know, the sacrifices are the children because, you know, that's what we're here for as far as educators are concerned. And so we have to look at where are the resources going throughout the city and not necessarily just, well, what is the uh, school district doing? What is, you know, because even with that, that was more so for building renovations and things of that sort. But, okay, we're talking resources with a child. What do they need? Mm-hmm. You know, yes, they need a safe building. And, and yes, I wholeheartedly agree that buildings have got to be, you know, up, you know, kept up as well because those are 100-year buildings. But at the same time, we also have to look at how are we educating the whole child mm-hmm. and what do we have in those community Um, spaces that are allowing for that child to learn, as you said, that they are learners outside of the classroom as well. Mm -hmm. Is there something that as a teacher, because I think not exactly in the same way, but teachers don't necessarily get to make key decisions because of what happens at, you know, pay grades and levels above them. Do you feel like you as a teacher, you have the support that you need in order to work with this high number of highly mobile students in your classroom? Um, I would say that uh, working at Ashland Elementary, we are a part of a CPN, um, which is two schools, Merrimack and Ashland, who we also have additional resources. And so I think that we have a different perspective. Um, Particularly myself, this year I've attempted to open my kids up to going to different field experiences. We've been on five so far, including uh, headed to, including Jefferson City. Mm-hmm. Um, and we went for parent, parent Action Day, excuse me. Uh, and I think that opening children up to experiences and realizing, that helps them realize what they have in their community versus what they don't. And so one of our social action problems or uh, you know projects that we have in my fifth grade class is 
look at the problem areas in your community and figure out a way to solve them. I think that we use media for a lot of things, but why don't we teach kids to use media to solve problems? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, and it's great for them to have fun because we all have fun on social media, but that is also one of our voices. That's that's one of that's a way that we are able to exercise that First Amendment and teaching kids that that's what that is. It, it teaches it, it helps them learn things about their world, which is, you know, social studies. Mm -hmm. And that's a content area. So I think maybe it's helping kids apply the learning that they're learning inside of the classroom and moving away from, well, OK, well, I'm presenting this worksheet. Let's get kids to be able to actually practice the things that they're learning. So you're preparing them with things that they can use, whether they stay or go somewhere else. Would that be one way? I would say that's correct. I mean, okay. they're, they're you know, attempting to, we, they have to solve the world's problems in the future. Mm -hmm. So how are we preparing them for that? So we've been speaking here with Jason Jabari, assistant professor in the Brown School at Washington University. Uh, Jason leads the education research portfolio at WashU Social Policy Institute and was one of the researchers on this report that we've just been talking about. Andrew Eason is a fifth grade math, science, and social studies teacher at Ashland Elementary in St. Louis, and that is in the Penrose neighborhood. He's been talking with us about what he has seen with a teacher's eye. Um, in the classroom. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Today's episode was produced by Alex Hoyer with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. Our executive producer is Alex. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Our podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.